last class talking about confidence intervals when we had um, kind of two sample means. So we're looking at the difference in sample means, but we only have sample variances, right? So we're going to do the same type of example today, but we're going to see how we do hypothesis testing. Right? Once we work through a hypothesis testing example, I'll, I'll kind of show you how we do this in Excel. So the steps are going to be exactly the same as what, whoops, what we were doing before. The only kind of difference is now our degrees of freedom, right? It wasn't n minus one because we have two populations. We said we had to use that crazy equation, right? So we're kind of using delta to kind of signal, signify that equation, right? I'm not gonna make you kind of do this. I'll always kind of give you what this value is. I'll give you what the degrees of freedom is. And then here's our test statistic equation. It should look exactly like the same equation that we were using before for the difference in sample means. It's just now, Instead of kind of population, we have sample variances. So if we go back, I think it was it would have been on Friday, Wednesday, Friday of last week. And this is what we were looking at, right? It looked exactly like this, but now we because we only have sample variances, our test statistic isn't a Z statistic; it's a T statistic. So if we work through an example, right, and kind of see how we apply this when we have some actual values. Let's assume we want to determine whether or not male doctors earn different salaries than female doctors, right? Maybe we want to do some kind of wage gap identification and stuff. So we take two samples, right? 41 male, 41 female physicians. We've got two different sample means for those groups and then the sample variance we find. Okay. Well, if we're wanting to just test for whether or not these salaries are different from each other, what we're thinking about there is really is that mean male salary anything other than that female mean starting salary. Well, if I write out my assumptions based off of what the difference is, I have to rearrange this a little bit so that I'm thinking about the difference. I just use a little bit of algebra, subtract the mean of females from both sides. So is that difference anything other than zero, right? So I'm not actually assuming any values, right? These two could be 150,000, they could both be 170. All I'm saying there is like, is that, is that difference anything other than zero, which makes my null, right? Whatever I want to test for is my alternative hypothesis. So my null would just be the complement, the complement of not being equal to zero is being equal to zero, right? So I'm assuming that that difference is zero, but you know, I'm not assuming like the level. Right, they could both be 150,000, they cancel each other out. They could both be 170,000, they cancel each other out. So I've got a two tailed test here, right, based off my normal term of hypothesis. So I think the next question is if we're using the critical value approach, right, so we've got this two tailed test. What is our critical value for the 1% significance level? And I'm telling you that if you use that equation, you plugged in your variances and sample sizes, you'd find a degrees of freedom of 80. Okay. So what we want here is the 1% significance level, our alpha is 0 0.01. We know our critical values will be coming from that student T distribution because all we have are sample variances. So we want for a two-tailed test, we're going to have two tails, so we need kind of the cutoff values or the critical values that would give us alpha total in the tails. Well, if alpha total is in these tails and they're equal size, then on each side we'll have an alpha over two. Our alpha was 0 0.01. So the area that we want in our tails is 0 0.005. We want to find these T values that would give us 0 0.005 in those tails at degrees of freedom of 80. Okay. So we go to our student T distribution. We wanted 0 0.005 in our tail, all the way down at degrees of freedom of 80. So 2.639. So our critical values are 2.639 and negative 
three, nine, right? We have a pair of critical values for these two-tailed tests. We can think about our rejection region. Is anything more extreme than those critical values or larger in absolute value? Or draw the arrows into the tails? So now what we need is just to find our test statistic, right? If it falls in that rejection region, I reject. If it's not in that rejection region, I'd fail to reject, okay? So another way to think about this is basically, if I see any sample evidence that is more than 2.639 standard deviations away from the assumed true difference, then I can reject. So we go back to the example that we had. We've got our critical values. Now, how do we find our test statistic? Well, we have that equation that I showed you earlier. It's really, once we've identified the correct equation used for our test statistic, it's just a matter of plugging in values, right? So here I've got my test statistic equation. I said I'm always giving you examples where the assumed true difference is zero. So this kind of like goes away. So you just take the difference in the sample means, divide by the square root of each group's sample variance divided by its sample size, okay? So I think once we kind of get through all these examples and um, maybe once we get, uh, you know, I kind of do a couple of videos after Thanksgiving of like some exam review stuff, I'll kind of walk through. It's really the important thing with test, test statistics is being able to identify the correct equation. But if you see these on like a formula sheet and you're looking for the differences in sample means and you only have sample variances, this is gonna be your guy, okay? So once we get everything plugged in, we get a test statistic of 23 almost. That's huge. That means I'm 20, the sample evidence I found, which was a pretty big difference in salaries, is 23 standard deviations away from that assumed true difference. So if I'm thinking about where my test statistic is, I'm plotting it, 23 is like way over here. So I'm clearly in my rejection region. Right, so I can I can reject, and my alpha was 0 0.01, so I can reject at the one percent significance level, or kind of with ninety nine percent confidence. Okay. Any questions on that? What if I had asked you to find the p value? So p value is a probability I saw the test statistic I did, or anything more extreme. Now I have a two tailed test, so I'm going to have to remember I multiply it by two. But what's that area going to be really close to? The area to the right, if the area to the right of 2.6 is 0 0.005, the area to the right of 23 is basically zero, right? Almost zero times two is still going to be pretty close to zero. Right? So I'm going to have a really low p value. My p value is approximately zero. Right? So if I only reject if that p value is less than alpha, doesn't matter what alpha I put in here, zero is going to be less than all of them. So I can reject at pretty much any level in this example. Because I found really strong evidence that the assumed true difference of zero is in fact not true. Right? I found a sample difference that was pretty, well, I think it was like $30,000 or something. Okay. So we got our test statistic. What levels can we reject at? We had 99 problems, but rejecting the only one. Um, anytime we have a really like a p value that's close to zero, right, we're going to be able to reject it any out. So instead of doing matched pairs, oops, mix it out of this. There we go. We're going to look at how we do some of this in Excel. Okay. So if you go to the male data sheet, right, we have this female data sheet as well. I separated kind of out male and females um, from from an original sample, and I've got their BMI. So I use the average function, find female BMI, the sample variance in female BMI, and the sample size of females that I had. And then on this male data sheet, did the exact same thing, but for the male BMI. Right? We've done this a, quite a few times, so I'm not going to review this too much, right? Use the average function to find the mean, var.s to find the variance, and the sample size, we'll just use that count function. I also could cross-reference the sheets here, right? I just put equals, clicked on the sheet that had the female mean, select it, hit enter. And now Excel automatically kind of put in, use that female data sheet and go to L2, okay? So I've got my sample means, sample sizes, oops, sample sizes, and my sample variances. 
has everything I'm going to need to build confidence intervals and do some hypothesis testing. Now, I also had, just like I showed you last class in your Excel assignment, I had that kind of nasty equation that found my degrees of freedom already kind of pre-programmed in there. I can't use it like this. I need an integer. So I pushed it down or I floored it down to the next lowest integer. So even 6,459.8, right? We don't use normal convention like rounding rules. We always round it down when we're trying to find the degrees of freedom here. Okay? So here's my degrees of freedom. If we remember what we were doing last class, we had this equation for our confidence intervals. So here's our lower bound, here's our upper bound. We're basically gonna use Excel to be our calculator. And we're also gonna use Excel to find these exact values for, the t, for, our, um, for these t values that we need. Okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is let's find those t values. Right? Anytime we know the area that we want in the tails, and we can think about the tails here like are the two sides of my confidence interval. I'm working in reverse where I know the area and I want the t value that gives me that area. So alpha divided by two, right? Half of alpha on each side of my confidence interval, comma, here's my degrees of freedom. Excel will kind of use that degrees of freedom and find what t value will give us alpha over two on each side of our confidence interval. Now, the issue is when we use this, we're always thinking about the area to the left. In my equations, I already have built in kind of the negative and the positive sign. So I just want to, whoops. So I just want to use Excel, right, to give me that the absolute value. So I include ABS there at the beginning. Now I know that it's just going to give me the absolute value of that T value. So I'll hit OK. All right. Now I've got my T value. Now if I copy this down, what went wrong? Well, I did want my alpha to update when I'm building the three different levels of confidence, 99, 90, sorry, 90, 95, 99. But my degrees of freedom, that reference should stay the same, so I'm gonna put some dollar signs around that, okay? Now when I copy this down, it won't update that cell reference, it only updates the cell reference for alpha. At this point, I'm really just using Excel to be a calculator. So if I look back at that confidence interval equation for the difference in sample means, I build my interval around group one minus group two, the difference in their sample means. I then subtract my margin of error. My margin of error is composed of this T value multiplied by the square root of each group's sample variance divided by that group's sample size then add in the next group's sample variance divided by that group's sample size. And that should give me the lower bound. Now, one of the useful, you know, the powers of Excel is I don't have to sit and enter this into my calculator once to find the lower bound, another time to find the upper bound, then do that again for the next confidence level. I can copy this and kind of have it, do it all pretty quick. Now, the issue is when I'm building different levels of confidence, the only thing that really changes in my equation is this T value. So everything else, I want to stay the same, right? I want to keep using these same values so those cell references shouldn't change. So I'll highlight this, hit Command T on a Mac, FN, F4, if you have an FN key, if not, just hit F4. Select this over here, we don't want this to change, so kind of freeze that as well. Let me go over so we can get this on one line. There we go. And now I have my equation that will give me that lower bound. I copy this down. Notice it keeps using this original values. It just update, updates that T value, okay? So I want the exact same equation for my upper bound, but instead of subtracting that margin of error, I wanna add it. So I'm gonna go into this cell, copy, hit enter, go to the cell, paste it. When I do it this way, my cell reference here doesn't update. The only thing I want to change now is instead of subtracting that margin of error, I add it. Once I've got that, I'll copy this down, and I've got my three confidence intervals. Any questions on that before I keep moving? So what's interesting here is, I want to point out two things. One, if I look at these T values, and I go back to the example we used 
would have been last Friday, I think. And we're using that standard normal distribution. These values are very similar. 1.644, 1 1.959, 2 1.750, 1 1.96, 2.57. They're really, really there. I think out to the fourth decimal is they look almost identical. And the reason why is because as we get higher and higher degrees of freedom, our student t distribution starts to get closer and closer to a standard normal. Notice we got a really high degrees of freedom here. Right? We have sample sizes, kind of a total of sample size of, of over 6,000. Okay. So we get t values, there, but nonetheless, they're very exact, right? It's still using that student t distribution. We don't have to approximate it. Also, what we can say is with 90 and 95% confidence here, I know that the true difference between kind of male and female BMI here are only negative values. So what that's telling me is with 90, 95% confidence, I could say that kind of male BMI is lower than female BMI. Right? Now, once we get to hypothesis testing, we'll talk a little bit more about does that even mean anything here. But with 99% confidence, I actually couldn't say that they're any different. Even based off having a sample that's this large, zero is still one of the possible values here, right? I mean, there's even positive values. So I don't even know which way, do men have a higher BMI? Based off the sample, I can't say with 99% confidence, okay? So we'll go through some hypothesis testing and kind of relate that to the statements I just made about the confidence numbers. So the first thing, is let's find our test statistic, right? This is basically just using Excel to be a calculator. We're gonna take that test statistic equation that we had and just get that entered into Excel, okay? So we're gonna take the difference between male and female BMI, so the difference between those two sample means. We'll then subtract this assumed true difference of zero. Okay? So that's my numerator. I'm gonna use some parentheses here to make sure my order of operations works correctly. I'll then divide by the square root of each group's sample variance divided by that group's sample size. Add in the next one. And that's all I need to do for my test statistic. So this is going to tell me how many standard deviations away the sample difference I found is from this assumed true difference of zero. Now, you don't have to necessarily subtract that zero if you don't want to. I'm gonna show you something in a little bit that just to kind of show you. I'm giving you examples that are always zero, but you could in the application use other values. So we get a test statistic of about negative 2.36. So what we're gonna be doing is, first I'm gonna find, I'll show you how to do kind of the critic, um, First, we'll look at using that test statistic. How do I find my p value? So, negative 2.36. My p value would be the probability I saw something that far away from the assumed true value or even further that goes against the null. But the problem is with a two tailed test, it would have been equally as likely that I saw something that went against the null over on this side as well, if in fact that null hypothesis was true. So, once I find this area, to get my total p value, I need to make sure. I multiply by two, whatever area I find by two, because I've got another tail. Okay. So how do we do that in Excel? Well, using that test statistic, right, I can use not, you know, I'm, not, I'm using a student t distribution, so t, and then I know the t value now, and I want the area to the left, so I'm gonna use this t.dist. Okay. Tell it my test statistic, comma, Tell it my degrees of freedom, comma, put a one in there. It just tells it, make a cumulative look for the area to the left. Hit enter, so I've got my p-value. But what did I forget to do? Well, that just tells me the area in the left tail. I have two tail tests here. I'm testing for whether or not that difference is not equal to zero. So I need to multiply the area in the one tail by two because I know I've got two tails now for a two tailed test, okay? And that's how I get my p-value. Okay. Questions on that? Um, I want to move this over to give myself another column here. If I instead had wanted to find my critical values, 
Well, that's really what we just did in the one by hand. That's where I know the area in the tail, and I want to find the kind of pair of critical values that gives that to me for a two-tailed test. So what I would do is say, okay, my critical values are t dot i and v. I'm working in reverse. I know the areas that I want in the tail. For a two-tailed test, the area I want in each tail was alpha divided by two. Now, I could have probably set this up to look a little bit prettier, but I'm just going to use the alpha values that I had from up above because they're the same. Right? And then comma, here's my degrees of freedom. So this will tell me the T value that gives me alpha over 2, so 0.1 divided by 2 in that lower left tail, which that's great. And if I copy this down, I need to make sure, yes, the alpha that I'm using will update, but I also have to make sure that the degrees of freedom doesn't update, right? So I'll put dollar signs around that. So I keep using the same cell reference for my degrees of freedom. I copy this down. I'm going to move this guy down here. And here's my critical values for the three different levels. Notice they're the exact same as for my confidence interval, right? Because it's, it's the same alpha over two I want. It's the same degrees of freedom. So it's really going to be using that T value I was using to build my confidence intervals. Now, I have to remember I somehow need to indicate that for each one of these different alphas, I've got a pair of critical values. So I could either do like the absolute value of this and just show them side by side or um, type like this in next to them or I plus minus, right? Somehow indicating I have a pair of critical values. Okay. So if I look at these, I can kind of see that the test statistic is more extreme or larger in absolute value at the 90 and 95% level, but not the 99. We could have also used the p-value, which I think is a little bit easier to make our rejection decisions. So we talked about how can we do that. Well, if my p-value is less than, actually, before I do this, I'm going to set this up so it just makes it a little bit easier to see. So I'm going to move this over here. Call this alpha. So 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01. Yeah. So if my p value is less than alpha, comma, if that's true, I, I should be rejecting. Comma, if it's false, I should be failing to reject. Okay. Now, when I copy this down at the different significance levels, I want to make sure the p value stays the same. So I put dollar signs around that cell reference. Hit enter. Copy this down. Now I see that the 90, 95% levels, based off this p-value, I reject that assumed true value of zero. But at the 99% level, I fail to reject that assumed true value of zero. Which remember, that's the exact same thing that we, we kind of said with our confidence intervals. Zero was included in this confidence interval, so it could be a possible value for the difference. Right? So for a two-tailed test, these kind of rejection decisions, I know that for at the 99% level, any assumed true difference value that I use in this range, I will be failing to reject it. Right? Because the confidence interval tells me this range of values, any, va any value in between the low and upper bound could be the true difference. So if I run a hypothesis test, I'm not going to reject any of the values in that range. Any value outside the range, I will. Right? So for the 90 95% levels, zero was outside the range, so sure enough, I rejected it. At the 99% level, it wasn't outside the range, so I failed to reject it, because it could be possible true difference. Right? So when we're doing a two-tailed test, it lines up perfectly with kind of what we were doing with our confidence intervals. Any questions on that? Um, so I want to show you a couple things. One, what if I was using an assumed true difference? So I, what I just told you was if I do a hypothesis test for any value in this range, I should be failing to reject it here at the 99% level. So let's try instead of zero, let's use negative 0.6. Sure enough, I'm, I'm failing to reject it. What about negative 0.76? Right, I'm failing to reject it. But what happens if I go just outside the range, negative 0.77? Two tailed, oh, because I have this set up wrong. Hold on. Let's do, because uh, I had this was negative and now I'm getting positive tested. 
test statistics. Give me one second. Actually, this is, brings up a good point. So I'm never going to make you change this from zero, so you, you don't necessarily have this issue. But another way you could have found the p-value that kind of prevents, it doesn't matter if your test statistic is positive or negative. If you use the t dot um, this dot two t, and then you put in the absolute value of your test statistic, it, it needs you to do that because it can't recognize negative values. I don't know why they can't write the function to do that. They should be able to. Comma, degrees of freedom, close my parenthesis. Who knows, maybe someone from Microsoft will stumble across my YouTube video and then they'll fix it. But, um, so I'll hit enter here. So it does kind of the, the same thing. Um, it just multiplies it by two for me. So let's go back to zero, right? So that was the original p-value we had, it's the same. If I go to negative 0.76, that's in this range, so I should be failing to reject it. If I go to negative 0.77, it's just outside the range. And now I'm actually rejecting that value, right? So any value I choose within this confidence interval for a two-tailed test, I'll be rejecting the values outside that range, failing to reject the values in that range, okay? Well, back to zero though. Any questions on that? I won't make you ever use non-zero values, but just to kind of show you, kind of line up those things I wanted to. So I did all this work. I found the test statistic. I found the p-value, uh, rejection decisions. Do I need to like do all this kind of behind the scenes? Well, Excel will actually do a lot of the work for us. If we use this shortcut called t.test. So I'll first show you why it's really useful and then I'll tell you why it's not as useful. Right? So what I do with this t.test is, I originally had two variables, right? The first was, I was looking at male BMI. So I'll select that column of data. I'm going to scroll up here just to kind of show you that in the cell. Comma. The next thing I select is the second variable I was using, which was female BMI. Well, that was on a different sheet. So I'll click on that sheet and select female BMI. Now I can kind of see what it's putting into my equation up here in this formula bar. Anytime I kind of select to go back to that male data sheet, so, actually, I don't want that. Hold on. Okay, so let me do this again because I want to make sure that I show you guys how to do this correctly. So, I go to that female data sheet. I then select this female BMI variable. I then go up here and put a comma in and go back to my male data sheet. See how it kind of put in reference that male data sheet? I don't need that, right? I know I'm on the male data sheet now. And because I'm picking cells from this male data sheet, I don't have to worry about putting it in. So I just deleted that. So after I put a comma, so it takes that male BMI data, takes the female BMI data, then asked me what type of tail test. Well, I had a two tail test, so I put a two. And one if I had a one tail test. And then I have three options. The only options we're ever gonna use for this class are the one and the three, okay? So inevitably when someone does the Excel assignment, someone's gonna choose two and it doesn't matter what example, we never use that, we're not gonna use that one. So we'll talk about match pairs a little bit before we get out of class today. But the one that we're looking at is we have kind of two samples, two sample means, and the variances aren't the same, right? The variances that we're, we're sampling aren't the same. So we're gonna choose option three. I then close that parenthesis. What this does is it calculates from the male BMI variable I selected, it'll calculate the mean, the sample variance, the sample size, and then goes to that second variable, takes the mean, finds the mean variance and, and sample size. Using those, it then sets this up as group one minus group two, calculates your test statistic, because it's got all the things it needs now to do that, from there, it also calculates the degrees of freedom, uh, goes to the, the, the student T distribution for that degrees of freedom, uses that test statistic, finds the area you know, in the tail. It's a two-tailed test. It multiplies it by two, and it spits out at you the p-value. So if I hit enter here, I get the exact same thing as if I had done all the kind of work behind the scenes. Now that's really useful 
and like a great shortcut for sure and save us a lot of time. The only issue is there's no option in that t dot test for me to change this value. So for us, anytime we're looking at, you know, do I want to find the p value here? Well, I can use that t dot test because I'm always using the assumed value of zero. But anytime I wanted to use any other value other than zero, notice it's not going to change anything with that t dot test. It can only work under the assumption that the assumed true difference is sorry, the assumed true difference is equal to zero. Okay. So very useful, but has its limitations, right? Which is why it's important to know how we could do this on our own behind the scenes in case we you know, ever have a test we're gonna do where the value, assume true difference isn't zero, which in practice it very well could be. Right? Any other questions, on, any questions on that? So I did three different types of examples that, um, I believe the one on the Excel homework should look very similar to, nope, not there. Very similar to this difference in proportion one. The one we just went through today should look very similar to when you're looking for the difference in means and only have sample variances. Um, on the completed, it says like two population HT complete. There's another proportion example here too as well. If you just want to get kind of another example and it would, you know, on the same sheet here. So maybe instead of bouncing back and forth as you're working on the Excel assignment, you've kind of got a good template for both of those types of, of examples right here, but it's just another example, okay? So there's no questions or anything in Excel if you don't want to see another cell again or anything like that. I'll introduce kind of the next idea to you. And we probably won't go too far today. It might, might get out a little early today. I think we went through things a little bit quicker than Oh, you know what? Before we get there, I do, I do need to point one more thing out here. This is what I wanted to do. Okay, so notice that we found a very small difference between male and female BMI. Like the actual difference we found was what? Negative 0.37, right? So if I'm thinking about when I assume that difference is equal to zero, I'm looking at the distribution of that sample differences I could find should be centered around that assumed true difference of zero. I found a sample difference of 0.37, negative 0.37. So that doesn't look like it's very far away from my assumed true difference, right? But remember that test statistic has in the denominator, this represented the standard deviation of the differences in my sample means. So if I had really high sample sizes, which I had like sample sizes of 3000 here for each group, if I'm dividing by a very large number here, what's gonna happen to this? It starts to get really, really small. Right. So if I have really high sample sizes, it's probably not that my distribution looks like this. If I'm trying to draw it to scale, it probably looks, you know, something like this, where all the values really close to the mean are the only one that it's likely I'm going to see. Right. So seeing something, even though it doesn't look like it's very far away from that assumed true value, it could be a large number of standard deviations away. Okay. So if we look at kind of what we have um, here, we have really high sample sizes. So even seeing a small difference ends up resulting in a test statistic where we can reject that assumed true value, right? Um, so I, I wanted to kind of make sure I kind of, kind of went through that and I pointed that out. Um, you know, in fact, you know, and also we're rejecting, like you saying that males have, I guess, lower BMIs here, but I mean, how much lower, right? If I actually wanted to start playing around with this, are they even 0.2 lower? Well, I can't reject that at any level. Um, 0.1 lower, sorry, negative 0.1. I can only say that with 90, you know, so even though I found evidence of a difference, it's not a in magnitude significant difference, right? Um, oops, so I wanted to point that out before we kind of moved on to talking a little bit about matched pairs, okay? 
So matched pairs are kind of these cool examples um, where we have gathered information on one population, like one sample. So we don't have two samples anymore, but we might have like two time periods, right? And I think uh, on, on Friday, I'll, I'll walk through an Excel example where it's, it doesn't just have to be time, but a lot of times it is. So like a before and an after, right? So a good example of this is, let's say I'm interested in, I made some change to some workstation layout, and I wanna know if productivity has improved. So I've got 10 workers, and I measure their productivity before I make the change and then after. Excuse me. So what we're going to be doing, the way we can think about this is, so I've got workers, uh, I don't know, John, Mary, Joe, Pete, 10 workers, right? I have their kind of before productivity and their after productivity. So I'm just going to make some numbers up. Maybe this is like the number of uh, products that they sell in a certain, you know, day, in a day or something, right? And I have some measure of that productivity. Okay. Well, um, what I'll do is I'll create this new this new difference variable where I look at what was the change for each individual in their productivity. So John's went up by four. Mary's went up by one, Joe's went down by one, and Pete's went up by five. Okay. What I'm then gonna do is I'm now gonna treat this difference variable the same way I would a sample mean, right? I can find the average difference or the average change in productivity. I can find the variance associated with that difference, right? And I can then do things like say, well, is that difference greater than zero, right? Was there a, on average, was there a positive change in productivity? Now it's not quite the same thing as looking at what was, you know, after productivity's mean minus before productivity's mean. Here we're looking at what was the average change per worker, right? So we're looking at the same sample, but kind of the difference between two time periods. Like I said, next, next class, I'll show you some examples where it's not just time periods, but a lot of times it, this, is, this is how we'll have it set up. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? So we'll create this new variable, but now once we have this new variable, it's essentially everything we were doing before with a sample mean. So one population. So I create this new difference variable. I can then find the mean of that difference variable and the variance of that difference variable, and I can start to build confidence intervals. Well, I mean, notice this is, I mean, what we had before when we were looking at a one population sample mean example, and our degrees of freedom here was just n minus one. It's gonna be the exact same thing. It's just now we're notating that, well, we weren't just looking at an original variable X, we're finding the mean sample mean of this difference variable that we created, which kind of represents this change. We only have a sample variance, so we still use kind of that student T distribution. But remember, we only had one population. It was the same 10 people. So we go back to being able to use N minus one as our degrees of freedom, right? And then here, it's the same thing. It's just now my variance is for that difference variable, and I've just got my one sample size. So it's going to be almost identical to what we were doing before when we had a one population sample mean example. It's just starting out, we had to calculate the variable that we were finding the mean of, right? Um, that's not going to be anything, anything too crazy. In fact, I'll just kind of, since we've got a little bit of time here, we'll work through some more examples kind of um, with some actual numbers next class. But in Excel, just to give you another view of like what this would look like. I might start out with, oh gosh, what did I do wrong there? Hold on. Oh, I put 10, okay, I was gonna say. All right, so I have this difference where I must actually delete this and show you how it is. So we originally started out with kind of, I have suicide rates, um, the number of suicides for different counties in different years, right? Well, it's the same sample of counties, right? And instead of time, right before and after, 
What I actually have here is in that same county, what's the difference in kind of male and in female suicides, right? And I'm kind of assuming that populations are, are fairly consistent, like about 50-50 in every county. That might not be completely true. But what I could do is take the difference between kind of male and female suicide. So I'm creating this difference variable. To do this for every single observation, if I get this black little arrow when I'm on over this green box, if I double left click, it'll basically do fill out the entire kind of kind of data set, right? So I don't have to like drag that down. I can double double left click there and it'll do it for me. Well, now that I have this difference variable, it's just okay. I can find the average difference, the mean, sample mean for this difference variable. I can do the sample variance. I mean, this looks exactly like what we were doing before. And I can do my, use my count function to find my sample size, right? Nothing, nothing is, it looks exactly like what if we're, we would be doing if we had a one population sample mean example. Um, so we'll, we'll use this example next class. We'll do some confidence intervals. We'll do some hypothesis testing. Uh, and we'll work through a few more examples um, by hand as well. I'll probably introduce the idea of linear regression Friday. And then uh, I don't know if we have any slides. I'll probably have to, I'll probably throw in some additional slides and re-upload the week 14 slides because I'm guessing we'll have some time and I want to introduce the idea of linear regression. Um, what I'm going to do though, because I am going to, I mean, I'll be here Monday if you want to show up, if you don't understand, but I'll be filming a video either or a, a recorded lecture either way. I want you guys to read through um, some linear regression stuff um, by that class on Monday. So I'm going to put up a, the last, so this should be the last Learn Smart, and I want you to try to read through that um, either this week or, or this weekend, but prior to class on Monday, okay? So that'll, that'll be getting popped up there on, on, uh, on Canvas. But that should be some easy points. I guess that's the last to learn smart. Make sure you get on and get it done. Um, other than that, are there any questions for me? Because otherwise, um, probably end it here and we'll, we'll pick up this discussion on Friday. Okay? All right. We'll see you guys on Friday.